Now we come to the third portion of our series having to do with God's purpose for the believer that we might be conformed to the image of his son. And we are still covering material that has to do with the how of God's work of God's carrying out his purpose how so important to realize God's ways it's a part of understanding him of course and it makes things so much easier when we understand why he does a thing and how he carries it out and once we understand these things we our questions fade and our fear flees and we have rest and we have confidence and we have appreciation and we have understanding of God our Father and one of the reasons it's so important to know how he does things is because as we said before he works so much by the principle of paradox the opposite of what things seem or what one would think for instance one of the main things that God uses for a Christian's development is failure the Christian's failure that the way up is down and of course this is the very thing that the Christian is seeking to avoid he doesn't want to be a failure he doesn't want to fail God he wants to be a successful Christian naturally and that's uh, what God is going to make him as he learns to rely upon God but in his development in the process of it all failure is the foundation when we're young Christians we are so taken up with testimony verbal mainly as we grow we begin to realize that the life is equally if not more important but we we want to have a good testimony before others and we love the Lord Jesus and he's so wonderful and we want everyone to know him we want everyone to be saved we can't visualize them dropping into hell and we're so upset about everyone and there's nothing wrong with this it's normal And we start off so strong and eager and full of love. At least we should in a healthy new birth. And it isn't long before we come to realize that deep within there is that old element of self reasserting itself. That what we thought was gone and we were rid of and free from seems to be there yet. And we're aware of uh, things that shouldn't be within after a time and our first reaction of course is to hide this from others we can't possibly lose our testimony we can't possibly let the Lord down that if uh, these things were to be known by others uh, we practically feel as though God would be dethroned that the Lord Jesus would lose out completely and so it isn't too long before there is a strong element of hypocrisy that enters into our brand new Christian life and of course this double dealing this uh, 
lie that we're beginning to live has a terrible effect upon us. And there are those who begin to notice it. And our one thought at all costs is to hide all failure and present a strong testimony to others. And of course, with this going on within our hearts, the joy and the free sharing of our new life and the spontaneous love and outward uh, outgoing testimony fades, crippled. So people begin to say that we're uh, backsliding, maybe it wasn't real at all. And they exhort us to uh, read our Bible more and pray more and go to church more, go to prayer meeting more, do all sorts of things to get going again. And of course, we struggle and try as young believers. There's a civil war going on within. We love the Lord Jesus, and yet self is coming into the picture strong. <clears throat> and then later on, when we get through this phase a bit, just a bit, just enough to keep going, there's still the civil war within. We may even win some souls, get some decisions or some commitments, as some people call them. We begin to find that many of these decisions don't hold up because we've uh, actually because we've uh, forced someone into something so often we we have uh, we've really picked the fruit before it's ripe. We have uh, brought people to a decision to be saved before they are fully aware that they're lost. And these things don't hold up. Uh, pretty soon our new convert loses interest and uh, we have to go get him to get him to bring him to church. And uh, Well, it just doesn't work out so often. And we become uh, quite upset about this, begin to realize there's something wrong. But, of course, we blame others. We blame them for not really coming to the Lord Jesus. We blame them for not really meaning business. Whereas the actual fault has been in our approach and the fact that we were not ready and that we violated them in forcing them into something they were not ready for. And all of these things work upon us and have their effect, and we begin to wonder sometimes whether we're really saved. We begin to wonder whether God really accepts us. And we find ourselves in right at home in Romans 7, as Paul brought out in uh, verse 18 and 19. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. For the will is present with me. And we, we felt that when we were born again and we we wanted to live for the Lord Jesus and we loved him, that we thought, well, just because we had the will, we were able to perform. We were able to produce that which we willed. And we had to find out that we could not. That we do want to be good Christians and that we do want to live for the Lord Jesus. But the fact that just because we want to doesn't enable us to. And God is teaching us something about self and something about the fact that we are branches and not uh, the vine. But we're in the vine, and we're to be drawing from the vine, depending upon the vine for our very life and our very service. But we have to learn this through failure. And God is going to take the Christian all the way down to the bottom of Romans 7, all the way down to verse 24, where sooner or later... From our very hearts we cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
And we're going to realize that all that we can produce is death. And that we're complete failures as Christians. This is the first phase of our development, the negative phase, that God teaches us through failure to find out about self. And actually we find out about self first uh, before we really learn about the Lord Jesus. That the needs created in our lives through our failure condition us to really appreciate and learn of Him and appreciate Him and understand Him and really mean business to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need this need that failure brings. We must find out about self. There are many Christians who aren't even aware of self. They, they seem to feel that they're doing fine and that everything's wonderful and they have not yet discovered the plague within their hearts. At least they haven't faced up to it. They're not uh, looking in that direction. God hasn't brought them into circumstances to begin to bring this fact out, this terrible fact of self. But it'll come. And it must come if there's to be growth. This thought, oh, the discovery of the plague of one's own heart. It is never a pleasant experience, and it may be a startling one. It may come as a great surprise, but it is nevertheless a very necessary discovery to make and the sooner we make it the better for it is so illuminating and our growth in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ is bound up in this discovery there can be indeed no growth in grace nor any continuance in effective service without this discovery of self and the very thing that God is working to teach us and to show us through failure, we're seeking to avoid. We're seeking to turn our eyes away from this. And we're not willing to face up to it. But God understands this. And He's patient. And He's relentless. And He has a purpose for us. And He's not going to give in. I remember our very first home meeting when we were first married, Kenny and I. God gave us a group of hungry hearted Christians back in Brooklyn years ago. <clears throat> we met, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we met in a friend's apartment there in Brooklyn. I believe we met every other Friday night for about three years. We went through Ruth Paxson's book, Life on the Highest Plane. And this group was composed of Christians. Oh, most of them had been Christians for years. They were in the Lord's work, most of them. From the New York area there, they came over to Brooklyn. And we'd meet uh, probably 30 of us in this little apartment year after year and the reason they were there was that they had been failing in their service that their converts hadn't been holding up that they weren't getting the decisions and they realized finally that they were the ones that self was the problem and they came to this group hungry to find out about self and to find out God's answer to self and we had a wonderful time in those three years and we have been holding meetings in homes through the years since then. We call this first one the Paxson Group because we use the Paxson Book. And we've had many Paxson Groups since, but we haven't always used the Paxson Book. We've used other books along with the Word of God as textbooks, specifically geared to help Christians see the problem in their lives and to see God's one answer to that problem in the cross and in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the thing is that God must create this need in the Christian's life. And that need is built up and created through failure. And God says to the failing 
desperate Christian, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And it's the hungry, thirsty Christian, the one who is yearning for the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in his daily life, who has come to see that he cannot produce, and he cannot live for the Lord Jesus in his own strength, no matter how many years he's been a Christian. And he's come to see that it must be not I, but Christ. This Christian, failure as he has found himself to be, miserable as he is, hungry as he is, he's a healthy Christian, he's on the right path, he's being developed and, and processed by God. So this need from that is produced by failure, that arises out of the realization of self, leads the Christian on to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And this need is built up, of course, in failure in the Christian's walk and his life and the failure in his service. It's a dual failure. It's a complete failure. Then, then it is, on the basis of this need, that he hears Paul say to him, as he said to Timothy, study. 2 Timothy 5.15, study. And he begins to study the word specifically. Seek out in the word that which applies to his specific need, not just general Bible study, important as that is. Now, we've all experienced this, where when we're first saved, we rush out and we accost this one and that one. Oh, you must be saved. Are you saved? And why aren't you? And you must make your decision now. And we have our little set of verses and our little method. And we maneuver and we drive home our points to the one who doesn't know, who knows nothing of the Bible, nothing of the Lord Jesus. And we utilize our verses and we overwhelm them and we bring them to a decision how sad how sad so often but yet in doing this we learn how not to do it and we learn that he will do it in and through us for it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure the Lord Jesus reaching through the Christian, the Holy Spirit ministering. But as we have failed in our service, what has this done? This has caused us to examine our lives. It has caused us to be aware of our failure. It has caused us, it has driven us to God. It has driven us to the Word. Where we've gone back to the Word, licking our wounds, acknowledging our defeats, and we have gone back to the Word and really begun to study. And that's the way God trains us. The study is geared to a specific need, whether that need is in our own life or in our service in contacting others. It is a specific study because we will not take in that which we do not need. If we're not aware of a need, we just do not comprehend. We do not have the required interest and that's the secret of effective sharing. See that the need is created. And the sharing will be effortless and effective. Because the other will thirst and hunger and take and receive. And they'll be, they'll be aggressive about it. They won't have to be the pushing and the pulling and the forcing. So we really learn to study. And we learn to feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, that He is our life. We learn to feed, where Paul says, feed the flock of God. And we feed upon the Lord Jesus. We appropriate His life. We are nourished by Him. And then Paul says in Philippians, to think. And we think upon these things concerning the Lord Jesus. Whatsoever things are true, honest, and just, and pure, and lovely, think on these things. 
and those uh, those uh, purity and loveliness and honesty and all truth is in the Lord Jesus Christ and as we think upon him we think upon these things and that has an effect upon us so it isn't just thinking about ourselves things uh, around about us but to have a disciplined mind and our need will drive us to that that we think upon him who is our life and not just the thinking but to actually meditate to take time and to carry these things in our heart during the day that he's first with us he's number one and he's on, on upon our hearts and we meditate upon him First Timothy 4.15 meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy prophet may appear to all Meditation. The hungry heart will meditate, will think these things through, will spend time and give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to really reveal truth to him as he studies. And uh, Graham Scroggy, Dr. Scroggy, said that uh, spiritual development is a gradual process. All growth is progressive. And the finer the organism the longer the process. It is from measure to measure, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. It is from stage to stage, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. And it is from day to day. How varied they are. There are great days, days of decisive battles, days of crisis in spiritual history, days of triumph in spiritual in Christian service, days of the right hand of God upon us. But there are also idle days, days apparently useless when even prayer and service seem a burden are we in any sense developed in these days yes for any experience which makes us more aware of our need of God must contribute to our spiritual progress praise God for our needs even though they come through our personal failure And to realize that our needs are leading us to know Him. And we think of what Paul said in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him. And you notice what is coupled with that, that I may know Him, and the fellowship of His sufferings. We get to know Him really and thoroughly, deeply we get to know the suffering one in that way and we must never forget the truth in John 17 3 and this is life eternal that we might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent and the, the thing is that when we begin our Christian life we know something of what the Lord Jesus did for us but Christian growth and Christian development later on must consist of knowing the one who did the work and not just knowing the work that was done for us. And this takes time. It will take all eternity to really get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He's infinite. All the treasures of God are hidden in Him. And uh, eternally, eternity will not suffice for us to thoroughly know him he's inexhaustible he's infinite and he's our life but this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent and in Colossians 1.10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God because it's our understanding of him and our realization of who he is and what he is and how he does things that enables us to appreciate him and to cooperate with him 
and the rest in him. Well now to move on to more of God's how in working out his image in us. The first thing that we one of the first things that we learn as young Christians is that we uh, cannot produce this image. We cannot, by our own strength and effort, uh, be made like him. And after years of struggle, say, what good news it is to find out, to realize, that it is not our effort and our struggle. It is effortless. It is something that he not will do that he has done in the Lord Jesus Christ who is our life and that he'll work out in our lives he'll take that finished work and produce it in our lives day by day he will we do not have to produce it what good news this is to the tired struggling defeated heart and if we turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18 there is a wonderful truth here concerning this matter. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And it doesn't say there even as by trying with all our might. Praise the Lord for that. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one who will produce as he takes of the life of the Lord Jesus and produces it in our spirit, in the very center of our life. The Spirit of Christ, abiding eternally within, manifests the Lord Jesus. He does it. As we look upon the Lord Jesus in the Word, there is a principle, a law, that that which we love, that which we concentrate upon, that which we uh, look at continually, pay attention to, uh, we will be changed into that image. A very powerful law. If we are self-centered and only think of ourselves and want God to just bless us all the time and uh, look at God as sort of a Santa Claus, we're centered in self we're paying attention to self and we just become all the more self-centered all the more selfish and if we're interested in the things of this world for instance and uh, material things all the things about us take first place in our lives we just become more and more worldly and of course the worldly Christian is a miserable Christian God will not let him rest in that God uh, thinks too much of him for that the work of the cross, uh, that which the Lord Jesus did in the Christian's behalf upon Calvary, is uh, too great a price to settle for that. God will never settle for that. And the hungry Christian will never settle for that. So that as we uh, think upon Him, we're changed into His image from glory to glory or uh, from phase to phase or plateau to plateau or experience to experience there's a a progression a development a growth changed into his image from glory to glory and we think of this um, Hawthorne knew of this law in his uh, story of the great stone face where this young man grew up under this mountain that had this profile jutting out from it as you remember remember and he was so interested in this face and he uh, paid so much attention to it and was uh, so eager about it all of his young life that when he grew up he he looked his profile was similar to the profile on the mountain the law had taken hold of him and that law is uh cannot be broken if we
are interested in uh, non-spiritual things and we uh, take in things that self, the old nature, is interested in, we're simply feeding the old nature. We wonder why we're not growing. We wonder why we have so many problems. Why things are so hard in the Christian life. And all the time we're feeding the element that ruins everything. A TV, for instance. To have one of those things in one's home, a Christian home, is such a shame. Many Christians have asked, well, now, uh, what would you advise about this TV set? And I always uh, suggest that they get someone to help them carry it up the second floor and uh, drop it out of the second story window. What a lovely crash. Yes, the Lord wants us to feed the new man, to think upon these things, things that are lovely and pure and holy and the things of the Lord Jesus Christ as we see him in the word, as we fellowship with him during the day. The wonderful law of conformity is working in our hearts and we're becoming more and more like him. There's a special, especially here, a special good news from Norman Doughty for the Christian who has been struggling and seeking to be a better Christian, for instance and has tasted something of the failure of uh, trying to be and to do for God. The failure that God himself has brought about and engineered. And Doughty says, um, if I am to be like him, then God in his grace must do it. And the sooner I come to recognize it, the better off I'll be. Throw down every endeavor and say, I cannot do it. Well, a Christian is never going to say, I cannot do it, until he comes down at the bottom of Romans 7, through all of God's processing and failure. He's continually going to try until he really is defeated. And the thoroughly defeated Christian is the one on the very brink of healthy growth. But he thinks that all is lost, and he cries out, O wretched man. But, of course, his next cry, the only cry left, then is, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He will deliver me. Who shall? He shall. Praise the Lord. Dottie says to throw down every endeavor and say and admit, I cannot do it. And the more I try, the farther I get from his likeness. And isn't that so? Haven't you said that in your heart, dear friend? Oh, the, the more I try, the worse I get. Well, that's God's work. That's God's faithful work to bring us to the end of ourselves. The more I try, the farther I get from his likeness. What shall I do? Ah, says the Holy Spirit, you cannot do it. Just withdraw. Come out of it. You have been in the arena. You have been endeavoring. You are a failure. Come out and sit down. And as you sit there, behold him look at him there's the key that a Christian has to find out it's that simple off looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith don't try to be like him just look at him just be occupied with him well dear friend that's a full time ministry right there being occupied with the Lord Jesus when one is living in this body, when one is living in this world, it's a full-time ministry to be occupied with Him. Forget about trying to be like Him. You see, we're occupied with our ourselves, even when it comes to growth. We're not really occupied with Him during this struggle stage. We're occupied with the wrong element, Forget about trying to be like him. Instead of letting that fill your mind and heart, let him fill it. Think on these things, Paul said, the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just behold him, look upon him through the word. Come to that word for one purpose, and that is to meet the Lord. We mentioned before that when the Christian becomes hungry and needy, 
he studies the word specifically he seeks out from the word that which is geared to his need sure there's general Bible study one must get to know the word from beginning to end uh, at least a, a good solid acquaintance with the word overall God's overall picture but specific study comes in the realm where the Lord Jesus is revealed that we focus our thinking upon him and get to know him he is the one we need come to the word for the one purpose and that is to meet the Lord that is a devotional reading that is feeding upon him people who have a quiet time well that's the time to feed upon the Lord Jesus specifically that's why quiet times fail because there isn't the feeding uh, feeding to meet the need that one is aware of one who, that one is faced up to come to that word for one purpose and that is to meet the Lord Jesus Christ not to get your mind crammed full of things about the sacred word but come to it to meet the Lord Make it to be a medium not of biblical scholarship, but of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold the Lord. Certainly we're to be Bible scholars. Certainly we're to study and to get to know the Word of God thoroughly. But as far as our inner need in our growth and our daily development goes and our failure and to find God's answer to our specific failure and sin in our daily life that means focusing upon God's answer to it all the Lord Jesus Christ to behold the Lord but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That comes through study. It seems that Christians seek to avoid study so often and many of them are uh, promised a shortcut that they can get what they need by experiences by certain uh, so-called blessings and of course we're all aware of the fact that the people who whose lives are centered are blessing-centered and uh, experience-centered are usually the people who are not students by any means. And the tendency is when one gets involved in some sort of experience that he he's so aware of that and he thinks he has such a blessing there that he the tendency is not to uh, need to study. He knows something already so definitely that why study about it? He knows it in experience. And he is taken away from study even if he had the inclination to do so. Or even when he does study, his study is so focused and centered upon the realm of his experience that he's trapped and he's limited and he's curbed into one certain little area and all of his thinking concerning the word has to do with that main area and he's limited and his uh, growth is badly curtailed and actually these experiences what they do is make one self-centered because that experience is a blessing so-called to this person and it is focused upon himself and the penalty of that experience-centered life is the penalty of self, the development of self. And a 
loss in the knowledge and realization and appreciation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a law of growth. And the law of growth is for to me to live is Christ that the Lord Jesus might more and more fully take over in one's life and he grows. And the how of that growth, one of the main elements of the how of that growth is, of course, our simple but definite paying attention to him in the word. And the result of that is growth. And a result of healthy growth is comes from from healthy growth. One of the results is the law of service it results and takes over. We can see the law of service in John twelve twenty one, and there were certain Greeks saying, "Sir, we would see Jesus." And there is unsaved, the unsaved, or even the saved, who want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Sir, we would see Jesus. That is service. Where those outside of Christ and those who need growth have the opportunity to see him in and through his own. And as one grows, it's for me to live as Christ. And it's not I, but Christ, more and more fully. So that people, when they become upset about their condition, become hungry, they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. And they have the opportunity to see something of him in the life of the Christian. That's service. And that's the only true service. where hearts are conditioned by the Lord Jesus himself in and through the Christian through the ministry of the Holy Spirit so it's a long path of failure first while the Christian is coming to know something of self which goes on, incidentally, all of his Christian life while he's here in this body on this earth. God faithfully revealing new depths of self, which is which he does so that there be more growth, so that the Christian chooses the Lord Jesus over and above self, not I but Christ. And the struggle and the failure is a blessing, actually, because it leads to growth in Christ. And when a Christian, a hungry Christian, comes to realize this and see this, it doesn't make him lax. It doesn't give him license to feel and have the attitude, well, uh, my failure is going to give me blessing so uh, why bother no the very hunger of his heart the very work of the Holy Spirit within his heart keeps him pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus the very need keeps him pressing on the realization of this truth that failure is the groundwork for growth is not detrimental to the hungry Christian. It is very important for him to know it. And this thought by this bit of poetry by Tristegan, who knew this fact that 
failure is the door to growth and the fact that growth is a result of the life of the vine, not the effort of the branch. The branch is a partaker, not a producer. And he uh, expresses the cry of the hungry heart here. He expresses and uh, reveals the truth of God, the Lord Jesus being our life, and he is the source of our living and the source of our service. Where Tristegan says, Thou sayest, Fit me, fashion me for thee. Stretch forth thine empty hands, and be thou still. O restless soul, thou dost but hinder me by valiant purpose and by steadfast will. Behold the summer flowers beneath the sun. In stillness his great glory they behold. And sweetly thus his mighty work is done. And resting in his gladness they unfold. So are the sweetness and the joy divine thine, O beloved, and the work is mine. Yes, the work is his. It is God that worketh in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God who is carrying out his purpose in the life of the hungry believer to make him more and more like the Lord Jesus, that the Lord Jesus might more and more fully express himself in and through the believer. And all through this principle of paying attention to him, not through effort, but through looking and loving and fellowshipping and trusting and depending and study. Our Father, we thank thee for this time together. We trust thee for all of thy working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.